I had one student that wouldn't do anything. They gave him the method book, but he'd show me something. His dad was like a, a weekend warrior. He had like his buddies in the basement band. He was all into like Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, Beatles, just all this stuff. So one week I said to him, Alex, next week, bring me a CD of something you want to learn. And he brought in a Doors album. And so we learned a Doors tune and I wrote it down. And his dad came in the following week. He came in, he was like charging towards me. He's like, I want to talk to you. He walks in and he gives me a $50 handshake. And he says, I just got to say, man, my kid came down and played the Doors with us. And he was able to hang with his dad and his buddies. And it was just such a special moment between them. This is where everything stems from interest. Hi, teachers. Welcome back to the Topcast, the official music teachers podcast. You're listening to episode number 188. And a very special welcome to all my top music pro teachers out there. Hi, everyone. I hope you're going well and uh, the online teaching is ticking along now. Uh, I know some of you have been coming out of holiday periods. Some of you are starting to head towards holiday periods. Wherever you're at with this term or this semester, um, I hope things are going well. I know times uh, have been tough. Uh, People have been working incredibly hard and um, we are here to help and continue to support you, um, which we've been enjoying doing over the last two months. And it's been wonderful to see the progress teachers have been making, the feedback that they've been having about their own students and some of the benefits of this new uh, mode of teaching and also some of the benefits they're seeing in their own teaching when they reflect on their practice too. So that's pretty cool. Well, today is the 1st of May, which means that we're moving on from our online teaching theme from April. In fact, we kind of have had that theme going since um, I think earlier in the year as well. And this month, we're exploring everything to do with teenagers and transfer students. And I'm currently working on a brand new academy course to pull together all my resources, strategies, teaching frameworks and methods to help you approach teaching these students in the most engaging and motivating way possible because we know that teens can be troublesome sometimes. (laughs) So, they do need a different approach and I have been working on this course for about six months now trying to pull together all my resources and ideas, put all my thoughts in order so that you can have a really uh, step-by-step plan of action in a variety of ways and on a variety of topics to do with teens and transfer students because it's what my bread and butter teaching has been for the last 10 years. I really set myself up as a teen teacher uh, and I've enjoyed that part of uh, my, uh, my studio the most and it's what I've marketed myself as as well and I've always enjoyed that. So, I'll be talking more about that over the course of this month. And if you do have any questions on this topic specifically, then feel free to send them to support at topmusic.co with the subject teen questions, and I'll be sure to get them and then hopefully be able to respond to them. So, a few of the resources that I'm creating this month, uh, including this course, will be a student, a transfer student diagnostic checklist. uh, And this was something that was requested by one of our members, actually. A way of actually uh, following through a checklist, just like a doctor might have when they meet a patient for the first time, to see where they're actually at with things like sight reading and oral and chord knowledge and uh, being able to sing and things like that. So, a a step-by-step plan that you'll be able to download to do that. We've also got new teen and transfer student interview questions for those important first lessons or pre-lesson interviews. We've got first lesson plans, both for teens and for transfer students uh, and associated resources to go along with those. We've got bonus videos from uh, most of the teen method book authors out there, um, including The Piano Adventures, um, Supersonics, Piano Safari, who all have fantastic teen methods. So, I've invited them to record videos for us explaining their methods that we're all going to combine into a method comparison. Uh, And then also... We know that teens can be a really picky bunch when it comes to repertoire. So, all my best teen sheet music recommendations, the kinds of music they love, where to get that music from, and things like pupil savers when things are looking a really bit rough. What can you, what music can you give them to keep them in your studio? So, that's all coming up this month. Can't wait to share it with you. And um, just for today's show notes and full transcripts will be available at topmusic.co slash episode 188. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with my guest, Tony Parlapiano, who, let's face it, has the best piano teacher name ever. He teaches in 40 homes a week in Massachusetts and rarely takes on a new student because most families stay enrolled through to the end of high school. 
Today, we'll hear about his student-directed and interest-based approach to teaching, which aligns so well with my own, and some of the custom materials he's made for his students to teach pop, playing by ear, and real-world music skills. Tony is a piano instructor and the creator of Popmatics, a concept-based music curriculum that approaches learning by listening and reading through writing. In addition to traveling to his students' homes, Tony is an experienced online instructor who practices interest-led learning and specializes in teaching popular styles of music. Tony resides in East Longmeadow, Massachusetts, and carries a copy of his birth certificate for anyone who questions the authenticity of his last name. Welcome to the show, Tony Palapiano. Hey, thanks for having me. You're very welcome, man. We've got to start with the name because everyone obviously talks about your name. This is a legit last name, am I right? Yeah, that's right. I um and <laughs> I tell people <laughs> how, I actually, how I actually did this come from. <laughs> I didn't even start playing piano until I was like almost twenty years old, too. It's wow, like it should have been really? obvious, but um, yeah, it was. I played a bunch of other instruments, kind of growing up first, but uh, it's funny because everybody's you know, always asks like, how, should, what should I name my piano studio? I said, well, why don't you just add piano to your last name, like everybody thinks I did? Because it's just <laughs> nobody, nobody believes me. Nobody believes. Me. It's like. What what are those those names like a a baker being called Mister Bread or whatever? Right, right. <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. Anyway, Tony, look, it's great to have you on the show. I've heard lots about you. I've seen lots of the stuff that you've done online. You give so many people hints and help in Facebook groups and things like that. So your name was very common or very you know front of mind when uh, when we talked about having you on the show. So give us a little bit of an overview of the kind of teaching that you do uh, with regard to ages of students. And oh, I mean, we're all obviously online as we record this at the moment, but uh, generally speaking, what does your studio look like? Yeah. So it's been a blend over the last few years. So I do travel teaching and then I also, I've always, I've been doing online teaching for 10 years and, and now I'm doing a lot more of it. But um, <laughs> you're ahead of the curve. Yeah. So that, that was a pretty easy uh, switch to flip for me, but yeah. I guess the thing that might be a little bit different about my studio is, is that I'm 100% referral based. So I've, I've, never, I've never put out an ad for a student. So pretty much everybody comes through, they've already like kind of received an endorsement from a family that I've already worked with. So, and most of the time, the students that I work with are, are not beginners. They've usually had you know, a few other teachers. And so I'm known for kind of having this approach of interest-led learning where I really let the students take control of the material that they're learning. And I also kind of pair that with like a student-directed approach where I really try to get them to be in control of the decisions of, and how the, how the lesson flows. So my job is really, I kind of want to disappear and listen for questions. Now, of course, it depends on, you know, the age and, and things like that. But, you know, a beginner student, you, you have to lead them a little bit. But I just find that no matter, like everything stems from interest. So if I can just get them to ask questions rather than me just like delivering information, it's, um, it usually seems to, to stick a little bit better. Well, it definitely sounds like there's a lot of similarities between how we both approach lessons. I am also a huge fan of taking on transfer students. <laughs> it's just where I really enjoy uh, working with students and, and just trying to particularly re-engage them when previous teachers and lesson styles have disengaged them. And I imagine that's very much the same for you. And we'll talk about how you actually go about doing that um, in a little bit of time. What was your experience like with lessons when you were a kid? Yeah, so I, I didn't have them. I started late, but I was I was in like the um, you know the public school band program and things like that. But so I had that kind of like community experience and, and playing, but really no private lessons until in like high school. I, I started to pick up a little bit of bass guitar. My my brother, who's twenty two years older than me, had a little little uh, duo. If I could play bass guitar just good enough, he'd let me sit in with him. And um, then I started playing a little guitar and I took a few guitar lessons, but it, I really had no private lessons at all until I was in college. Second year of college, I took a jazz improv course. There was no piano player. And I was like, hey, I'll, I'll try this. And um, really? it, was, it was, yeah, it was, it, well. You must have dabbled on the keys beforehand though, right? A little bit, but like, I, I didn't even know like all my major triads and root position. Like okay. I had no business sitting down at the piano. Wow. But I learned how to play like C blues and that was it. And, and so it, it was, there was really no business me being at the piano. And I really realized later on, like I really didn't even have any theory foundation when I went to school for music. Like I just, 
I just knew like growing up, all my music teachers were my heroes. And I just, I thought I wanted to be a high school band director. But once I got there, I just kind of changed tracks. And uh, when I got into piano that summer, um, after I was like, hey, could I do this? Like, could I change this to my major? And everybody's like, what do you think you're going to do? <laughs> like, and I was just, I kind of like spent the summer desperately trying to catch up to everybody who'd been playing since they were six. What was the major? Oh, sorry. What was the course? Oh, this was just in, in college. I was, I was pursuing a music education degree. Okay. So you were doing music ed, but not on piano. What instrument were you focused on? Oh yeah. So I was, I, I played brass instruments, um, euphonium, okay. trombone, things like that. That was the track that I was on. Right. Okay. And then you realized that they needed a, a keyboardist for their jazz band and you're like, okay, I'll put it in my hand. This is kind of fun. I'm going to study this. It wasn't even a performing, it wasn't a performance class. It was like a jazz improv 101. So it was kind of like jazz theory. Okay. So it wasn't an ensemble at that point, although I joined those later. But um, it was just, I just, I thought it would be more fun to, to improvise on, on that than on, on the brass instruments. Well, I mean, this is a really interesting story. And I have a feeling that your current approach to teaching is, would have been hugely influenced by the fact that you started so late and you took yes. your own course. So tell us about your own feeling around that. Well, I, I mean, I can remember what it was like not to know. Like, you know, what it was like not to know about these concepts and, and, and to have them introduced to me for the first time. And so I picked up the instrument because I had played a lot of other instruments and I fooled around with guitar and stuff. I, I mean, I had like basic rhythms in me and things like that. So moving over to the piano, I was able to kind of play along with people like in groups and little bands and things like that. Um, I was able to do that fairly quickly. And so, but I remember like having to take two semesters of classical piano and this, this poor college professor is like basically dealing with a beginner. Oh, and no. this was like, I couldn't do anything right. I can only imagine, like, I, I think I must've been in his schedule as like lunch break. Cause he would just <laughs> sit on the sofa behind me and just like eat an apple and just like, he's like, that was wrong. He's like, no, it was a terrible experience. For you and him probably. <laughs> For him. Yeah. He didn't deserve me. He didn't, He's teaching out of college. He shouldn't have been working with, with like, I had just no background. I had nobody like explain any sort of technique or anything. So, um, you know, I was in the jazz band classes, but you know, you can make a lot of that stuff up as you went, you know, you got to hit the right chords and stuff. But like, as far as the rest of it's kind of, you want it to sound good, but I mean, like it's, it's jazz, you're improvising, you know, so right. I could get by on that. So was there a time, did a time come where you had to present a recital, play classical music, play the right notes and that kind of thing? What happened? Yeah, this is probably like the most embarrassing thing you could ask me. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I think honestly, because like, I think he had me play like Minuet and G, no joke, in college. Oh. <laughs> he had me wow. play Minuet and G because he was just like, that's the only piece that you can control, which is pretty hysterical to me now. So you finished your college degree and did you instantly then want to start teaching music or did that come way after you'd been uh, gigging for a while? Teaching kind of happened. That wasn't really planned. While I was in school, I was working for like a mom and pop music shop and they had uh, lessons going on there. So I was kind of like the guitar, keyboard bass guitar like salesman guy like so someone came in and wanted to buy a clavinova so this this woman came in i demoed the clavinova for her um she said you play beautiful do you teach and i said i said i don't teach the whole thing was we were supposed to be getting them to try to like stay at the store and she says well she's like you know i would love to have somebody come to the house so she called like every week for like two months and she was like, have you changed your mind? Would you like to start teaching? And so I finally, I told the owner, I said, look, she's not going to, she's not going to take lessons here. I said, do you mind if I, I'd, I'd love to give it a shot. And so I went there and it's, um, you know, sort of smaller town called Marble, Connecticut that really values the arts. And, and, um, she spread my name and within like two months, I had like two full days in her town. <laughs> wow. So, um, I left out with that and then the store got bought out by music and arts. And actually that, that, that was before Ricardo's, it was called Ricardo's music and they, they expanded, they built another store and they needed a piano teacher, like right around the time that I was finishing school. So I kind of just like, I became like the piano guy at their new location. And then I was there for a while until music and arts bottom out. And then, um, I just went off on my own and I, and I, I was pretty much doing just travel teaching at that point. 
Right. So having not been formally taught the piano, well, you kind of were at college level. What approach did you use to teach these students that you started teaching? Given that most of us will at least start by teaching the way we were taught and then soon realize that there's probably better ways. But what did you do? Right. So I did the opposite. I taught the way that I thought everybody else was taught. <laughs> so, <laughs> at the time, I don't know, what, what is this? Um, like early 2000s, maybe? The, um, so I'm, I did you know, what any new piano teacher would do. I, I, I thoroughly researched both method books that were at the store. <laughs> the, it's like, you got your Alfred and you got your Bastion. Which ones do you want to do? You, know? you, want the, you want the red book or the purple book? I tried them both. And, um, and already by like the third lesson, you're like, well, why didn't you practice? You know, you're, you're talking to the kids. It's like, well, well. and so what ended up happening in, you know, I would, I noticed that some students would just, they, they were just really, you know, they'd follow instructions and they just, they'd turn the page and, and they'd practice and, you know, whether they're because their parents told them to or they wanted to, some of that went, went fine. But there was a much bigger percentage of students that like didn't really practice as much as I thought they were going to. And I think I went into the job just thinking like, like, I love music. I'm going to teach music. This is going to be amazing. It's going to be the best job in the world. And then realizing that, you know, well, not everybody practices as much as, as, as you thought they might. And so I had one student that wouldn't do anything. They gave him a method book, but he'd show me something. His dad was like a, a weekend warrior. He had like, you know, his, his, uh, his buddies in the basement band. And um, he was all into like, you know, Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, uh, Beatles, just all this stuff. Elvis, he's, he's, he's bringing up. So one week I said to him, I said, I said, Alex, next week, just bring me a CD of something you want to learn. And I, I would always, I traveled with my little <laughs> portable CD player and I put it in there and he brought in a Doors album. And so we started, we, we learned a Doors tune and, we, and I wrote it down and his dad came in the, the following week. He came in, he was like charging towards me. He was like, I want to, I want to talk to you. <laughs> Push it. Put it in. And I was like, I'm like, what did I do? Like, so he walks in and he gives me a $50 handshake and he says, I just got to say, man, he's like, my kid came down and played the doors with us. And like, he was able to hang with his dad and his buddies. And it was just such a special moment between them. And so I realized right away that it's like, if this is where everything stems from interest, right? If you can teach them something that's connected to their value structure. I mean, this kid was like, he wants to learn the doors tune. And he ends up, you know, in a practice room on Saturday morning, learning a little brown jug. There's a disconnect there. And so I guess I kind of wanted to just remove that if I could. And I didn't really enjoy teaching from the method books myself. So, um, you know, I still tried for a long time to, to keep that going. Kind of like what everybody says now. It's like, we'll give you the, you know, you, you eat your vegetables. We'll give you a pop song, you know, or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. You know? And then over time, I just started creating more and more materials on my own. And I started just using a lot more of my stuff. And sometimes that was just writing for the student and letting them kind of give me feedback on it. I would almost treat it like episodes in a season, you know? I'm like, I'm just going to write just enough to get me through this lesson. And then next week, I'll write something else to connect to it. And then I'll give it to another student. So that was like writing original stuff. And then, and that was more so if they didn't have like songs that they, they could request, you know? I just felt like, you know, I can, I mean, I was like, I can write whatever I need to, you know, like. This, the stuff I was teaching in the book, I'm like, I can write something that I would enjoy teaching more than this kind of thing. And a lot of that is just because it is, I mean, I think that's, that's something that um, any teacher who's, who creates materials for their students will say. It's like, you just have so much insight into why you wrote it that way. Or, and so it, it becomes so much more enjoyable to teach it that way and then get feedback from the students and make the changes and find out what works. And it's, it's a lot of fun. So when you're focusing or you're offering a lesson that's more based around what the student wants to learn, how do you go about incorporating technique and sight reading and oral skills, some of those more basic and perhaps more theoretical, uh, if you know what I mean, kind of topics while keeping the interest up? Yeah. So I would say that um, as far as the, the technical stuff, I mean, a lot of that that comes in again, a lot of these students I've had have had a little bit of a technical background and they're, you know, they're transferring in and it's, and they're really looking more for, 
you know, just somebody to more connect with their interests. You know, as far as technique stuff, I try to incorporate that a lot, like through improvisation where you can like get them. It's hard to like teach technique when they're like trying to read notes and things like that. So they're all kind of separate, separate skills. As far as like the reading goes, I'll use supersonics with the, the younger students. Um, it gives them a nice, really graded approach to reading. My personal approach with teaching reading is I teach it through writing because that's how I learned. It depends on how a, a student brings me a song that they want to learn. You know, if we're taking the approach of, okay, we're going to go from radio to piano, meaning we're not going to start with the lead sheet. We're not going to start with anything other than the recording. So then I have like a whole process there where we start by like, you know, uh, trying to sketch out the chord structure and, you know, in a number based system. And then we might transcribe the hook, you know, like, like get that in there. And then we might try to see how can we incorporate that hook, you know, and it could be something if you're working with a beginner student, it might be something as simple as just using fifths and thirds and sixths in the left hand and just a single note melody line. And then from there, building it out. But as far as the reading, I find that writing, like I've never come across an issue with reading that couldn't be corrected through writing. You know, you're sitting there asking a kid like, what note is that? Okay. What? No, that's, how do you not know? That's an F, you know, it's like, just give him a pencil. Can you draw an F for me? And you'll find out what the problem is, you know, like, oh, you don't, okay, well, could you draw, C? you know, where C is, right? Okay. Can we count up? So it's, for me, that's, I try to get the kids to pick up the pencil. I try not to pick up the pencil so much during the lesson and get them to, to write their own notes and things like that. And it's like, you want to write a letter name in? I don't care. You can write a letter name in, but you, you got to figure it out. You got to write it in yourself. Things like that. How many students are you teaching at the moment? I think I have, I always have between like 35 and 45. I think I'm somewhere around like 42 right now. Okay. Um, most of them are weekly. Yep. And what, how long are your lessons? I have anywhere from eh, mostly 30s and 45 minute lessons. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that from my experience, while I love doing what you're doing and we have very similar approaches, it does take a lot of time to focus and to really unpack pieces and pull them apart and get people writing, get students writing and that sort of thing. So I just wondered how you went about uh, fitting that into a 30-minute lesson, particularly if you are working on repertoire or you know, band pieces or whatever it is as well. Yeah, so I, I really teach one thing at a time. I don't really have like all the theories connected to whatever performance piece they're, they're working on. So um, I try to keep students kind of like building a set list you know so when when they finish a piece it's like look, look you like that song you play it good just keep playing it you know just just keep keep it as part of your like weekly routine like you just run through it it's going to be fine you just maintain it right at that point so they keep those going and again since when you're in a creative process like a lot of the music that i'm teaching it's not really essential that everything is played exactly as it's represented on the page right like we're doing pop songs. We're not trying to preserve the museum here. It's, it's you know, you can be creative with this. We're going to have to be creative in a lot of tunes anyway. So I wouldn't say that I really offer like that balanced curriculum, you know, where I'm trying, I'm, I'm not trying to do everything. Yeah. But I, I try to connect everything to the one piece that we're working on right now, the one project that we're working on. And that can be separated into units. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to do, you know, you want to learn this. So you need to learn this theoretical concept to be able to, you know, do this. Yeah. And do you do any classical work or are you purely jazz, pop, rock kind of guy? Yeah, I don't have um, any classical background other than those two semesters. And, <laughs> uh, and that was it. I've attempted things on my own just out of curiosity, but I, I always end up, my mind wanders and I just kind of implement it into something else. So yeah, I don't, I don't really have that, um, that really, that background. I don't even know like sometimes like where to start although you know i did recently have a student that that just participated in a festival but i had a, a really good friend of mine like help me throughout like the whole process right just right. like he's like you know okay recommend these pieces and he did pretty good so i do have students that that like classical music and so i have taught like some of the classics i've taught moonlight sonata the hit list you know yeah yeah there are most pop songs uh, in their own right in a piano studio, aren't they? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And it's all done with the understanding. They know, they know where I am. They know my background and they know that, you know, if, they, if that's what they really want, then, then they should go somewhere else. Right. Or go see somebody else. 
And you're obviously uh, confident enough to be able to say that if someone was to be referred to you and they're all about reading classical music and going into competitions and things like that, you'd be comfortable saying, no, sorry, that's just not where, not where my skills are. It's not where my passion is. Yeah. And, and, you know, even this family that asked for this, they asked for more performance opportunities. And I'm like, I mean, my students like music, but like 60% of my families wouldn't care if I never mentioned a recital. Well, I was going to ask you about recitals. So that's really interesting. I do them for, for the, you know, the 30% that really want them. And it's always a good time. And it's because I let the kids pick whatever they want. The, the program is really kind of all over the place. You get video game music, you get soundtracks and you know, and then just pop tunes from the 50s on up. So you don't force your students to all play in a recital. Tony, this is <laughs> mind-blowing. Yeah, uh, you know, encouraged, but, you know, yeah, it's not required. Okay. The students who don't perform have another way to conclude studies on something. Do they record or YouTube or play in a band or anything like that? Yeah, some, I mean, some of them certainly do, but I also have some students that I've had parents that, you know, they really don't want anything assigned outside of the lesson, which some people would say like, well, I don't want to work with a student like that. Mm. I have no problem working with a student like that. As long as the relationship is good, the communication is good. It might feel like we're going sideways for a year, but like, I look at it as I'm not so invested in the results of my students. Like I want them to do well. But it's like, they need to decide where it is, where it's going to fit in their life. And, you know, if you're going to be an individualized instructor, if every single one of my students practiced for like an hour a day, I would just be like creating materials for them all the time, you know? So it's okay to have, I have some students in there where it's like, it's the fourth or fifth thing that they, they're really into, but it's like, they like it enough. And if I can, if I can approach it in a way where, Hey, I can show you enough. I mean, I can teach a kid in one lesson how to feel comfortable like approaching a piano and making beautiful music. Yeah. That doesn't need to take 10 years of training. You know, it's like you can teach a kid like cool stuff to do in a lesson. I know you do like the, you know, I, I've seen like you have like the notebook beginners thing and I don't know exactly the, that whole thing, but it's like, I'm the same way. Sometimes a kid won't, won't read standard notation, any, see, any standard notation from me for six months to a year. Yeah. And, and I have a lot of teachers say, you know, is it okay if my student only wants to play the Beatles? Or is it okay if they never read anything? Or is it okay if they always come back with a new tutorial they've followed on YouTube? And I, of course, say, well, what, you know, what is their goal? What are they trying to do? If that's in line with what they're trying to do and their parents are supportive, then great, go with it. I remember talking to Forrest Kinney, I'm sure a mm -hmm. name that you know. And sure. I, I remember interviewing him on a podcast once and he said he got this, uh, this teenager who only wanted to learn one, I think it was Beatles as well, actually, one Beatles song. He just wanted to learn that one and it took months and months. And at the end of it, Forrest said, well, should we try another Beatles song? <laughs> and he did. And, I, and he just went and again, Beatles, nothing else. And eventually after about a year's time, they started exploring other repertoire and, and things got a little bit more flexible. But if he hadn't kept going with what the student's interest was at that time, Hang on, I'm sorry, you need to do your scales and you need to enter this competition, then he would have lost that child. And so I'm, that's why I'm so with you in regard to this space learning. Well, if you don't mind me mentioning one thing, I, I pay attention to the way that people respond to, to communication, whether it's on the phone or through text messages. But I, I, I remember I sent this parent like a really beautiful text message just about how, how impressed I was with her, her son for how much he had accomplished in such a short period of time. And like the only thing she wrote back, she says, yeah, he says he's having fun. And to me, what that meant was like, if he had said he was not having fun, like she would probably stop the lessons. And so that's kind of in my mind. It's like having fun means we continue. Not having fun means we take a break. Right. But there's, you know, it's like, it's music, it's serious business, but it's like, we can still have fun. You know, we can still joke around, we can, you know, so. It is serious. I take every student with the assumption that I'm going to have them until they're 18, until they graduate high school. And so I don't really worry about pacing, you know, because I'm just like, they're going to get it. They're going to be here for a long time. I don't worry if they didn't practice this week, as long as it's not like a, a trend that's happening, you know, four weeks in a row and things like that. So um, 
that's kind of the other nice thing about not really following a set curriculum is like everybody's kind of on their own path. It's really hard for them to compare, even at a recital, like, oh, that's in, the, that's in level four, you know, that kid's in level four. Nobody knows. And it's all based on like how the song doesn't even need to be that hard. But if they can sell it, like if they can really perform it well, it sounds really impressive. One of the challenges that I have when I'm completely off book, doing my own thing, working with a student, is that sometimes if that self-motivation lags, having some kind of milestone in the future that they're heading towards, like, okay, we're recording this for YouTube in two months and that's the goal, or you've got an exam coming up in two months, or we've got a studio recital coming up, that can really sort of kick them back into gear without it being a forced kind of thing. And, and I'll often have parents come and say, oh, yeah, that, you know, they just suddenly did so much more practice and then the kid had more fun and things like that. My question is, do you sometimes have students that because your lessons, because you're, you don't necessarily have finish points or big goals to work towards, that they sometimes can just kind of swim around for a long time and not really get anywhere? Yeah. I never really made the connection that that might be the reason though. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it happens, but I always find that like, again, just if I can reconnect with their interest, because usually that's, I find students that sometimes get into this like thing where they're like, I don't know what I want to play anymore. And where it was like, they used to have a long list and I don't really know what that is sometimes, like why that happens where they'll, they're just like, they don't, they don't really have a project or they can't really think of one, or maybe they're afraid that the song that they're asked for is going to be too hard. But I try to really make sure that like, it's all vision based. It's like, can you picture yourself like really playing this? Like, and when you tell me you want to learn a pop song, like you better be able to tell me like who the artist is and tell me a little bit more about it. Like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want you to just tell me about the song you heard on the way home from, you know, on on the car trip home. I want you to really think about it. Like think about the songs that you really want to play. So I guess that's really the only way that I really kind of get them to really kick back in gear. I do encourage recordings. I never really make that stuff mandatory though. I just try to make the lesson experience as fun as possible and just, and just make sure that they're always playing material. And I'm, I'm totally fine with like, if, if someone comes to me and says like, Hey, I don't want to do this song anymore, then we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to pick something different. Like, you know, we're going to pick something different. And I have a million things that I can come up with on the spot. I have no problem like walking into a lesson and having no idea what's going to happen. Like, it's totally fine. We'll figure it out together. My uh, producer mentioned that you have some pretty good retention for your students. Can you tell us, do you think it's just about the way that you teach and the fact that you are just working with students' interests that your attention can be so strong or are there other tactics there? Well, I'm a travel teacher, so so it's convenient for them, which I certainly don't think that's the only reason. But I do think that when when it gets to a point where, where students are like in the teenage years and especially if parents have multiple kids and they're trying to bring them to several different activities. Like I, I, I noticed that even now, like with my own children who are not really even old enough to be in multiple activities, like they're just kind of doing the same thing. It's, um, it can be a lot and they have to make choices. And sometimes piano might let go where for me, it would be just like, Hey, you just need to be home mm. and like, and I'll show up. And so it makes it convenient so that, that the student can continue when they might otherwise not be able to. So, I mean, of course, if anything's important enough, they're, they're going to they're gonna make it work. But that's part of the retention. But the other part is, I'd like to think that it's because of the connections that I make with my students and, and the families too. You show up at someone's house for 10 years, you know, every Wednesday night for 10 years. You're part of the family. Yeah, you're not just their piano teacher. You're like, you're like their company after a long day. Yeah. And they're looking forward to seeing you. As a travel teacher, you know grandma when she comes into town. You know, you don't just know the student and whoever's dropping off the student. And that's really important to me. And, you know, a lot of people wouldn't think travel teaching. It's like, it's crazy. You know, it's, it's, how, how could you do that? And <laughs> yep. for me, I'm like, I'm like, I would lose my mind if I just had a static studio and I stayed in one place all day. Like, I like, I like to get out. I like to move around. I'm going to want to have breaks between my students anyway. So it's like, I might as well get paid more for, for the convenience of it, you know, like, because they, people are willing to pay more for the convenience of having someone come to your home. And so it, I think it's a combination of all those elements. But 
at the end of the day, I mean, I, I think a lot of it has to come down to just results too, you know, because there's going to come a time where if your students aren't producing results, the parents are going to wonder, well, what am I paying for? So speaking of uh, teaching approaches, I did want to finish by unpacking a little bit about how you actually go about this teaching because you actually have a whole lot of resources online called Popmatics, which I'm really keen to get into and find out a bit more about. So can you tell me what this approach is and how teachers out there who are listening might be able to use some of your ideas about this interest-based learning right now in their lessons to really capture some of those students, perhaps who are flagging a little bit? Yeah. So this has been kind of like a secret method <laughs> that, that, I, that I, I almost try to like keep it hidden a little bit. I go, well, I've stuffed that one up for you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. It's recently like more people have learned about it because I, um, I have some teachers that have, that have been using it and then sharing their experience and then people want to know a little bit more about what it is. It was an idea that I had like about two and a half years ago. And what had happened is I had an adult student that just wanted to learn how to uh, accompany himself to, to sing. He was actually a vocal teacher, but he just didn't have much training on the instrument. And so... He was retired and he just said, I always wanted to learn how to play piano. And I'm just embarrassed that I never really got to learn how to play piano. Like, and, and so it just seemed like no matter what I would do with him, though, anything that I would try to do through like standard notation or the, or the sheets, it would just like it was like creating a separation between him and the instrument. And there was just for some reason, there was like I just couldn't get through to him with any type of standard notation charts. And part of it might have been like, just knowing his background, I think I might have assumed that he knew a little bit more than maybe he did. And so anyway, I started creating these materials almost like through like spreadsheets. <laughs> um, I would create like chord tables and things like that. And I would use like colored cells, white and black cells to represent the colored, you know, the, uh, the keys on the piano. And then I came up with a few different concepts. And just over time, I just refined the materials and really pared it down to like the essentials of the things that I, that I really needed. And so the, the whole Popmatics thing is not really so much, um, it will eventually be like a method like, okay, like a teacher could just buy this and then go and like implement these steps. But it's really more of, it's, they're more like the resources that I use that kind of pair with a student who's going to use a lead sheet. Or if we're going to start with something just from the radio and we're going we're gonna to learn so I, I, have a, I have a group that I started for it. I call it Popmatics 101. And so in there, I share some of the things that I do with my students and the resources and how I kind of implement them with my students. And then people, you know, um, like I said, I, it's a small handful of people that are doing it right now. But um, this kind of just started in January. And um, I, had a, I had a little a book made up. And then I have a designer that I work with that kind of like makes sure all my charts like, like look nice, you know, that look nice and professional. Very like important. Homemade. Yes. Yep. The, uh, it is very important. But the interesting thing is like I I never made it with the intention of of having teachers like want to just come and get it for their students. I made it for my students. I made it because I wanted to use them. And um so people will say, "Well, why did you put so much effort in it?" Well, I said, "Well, I wanted it to look good." And I also thought that it would also increase the perceived value of my own studio just even locally, you know. It's like, "Oh, this is this is my thing," you know. It's so everybody wants to have their own thing. And I did too. And I think it's good. I think it's I, I think it's good. And I've I've gotten a lot of support from I was a little shy about like putting it out there at first because I was like, okay, I'm kind of like this pop guy without like, you know, I got a little bit of the jazz connection. I got a little bit of cred there. But like I'm like I'm in like these groups with like primarily classical teachers and like like I just like make up names for stuff. Like it's not it's it's not like it's <laughs> I think it's really refreshing. <laughs> yeah, well it's 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 not like I mean, everything's connected, you know, and that's what people have told me. They're like, you know, this isn't really so far off from like what we're doing. It's just like a different approach. And, but like, I don't use Roman numerals. I just use regular numbers, you know, Ar um, Arabic numerals. And people are like, why aren't, why aren't you using Roman numerals? And I'm like, close your eyes. Four. What did you see? Did you see an I and a V or did you see the number four? <laughs> and it's like, so like to me, and I said, it's so much quicker to write and all this stuff. So, and that's more in line with like Nashville number system and the way that they write. I kind of almost forget what the, the original question was, but the, um, <laughs> the way you're teaching, is it about teaching students how to compose chord progressions and pop music themselves? Or is it about, is it a structure or a framework around how to teach students how to play pop music that's already out there? 
Yeah, well, it's both. I mean, because I mean, they work together, but it's all. I use just basic number system stuff. So I want them to to hear everything in numbers first. I want them to think and hear in numbers because the benefit of that is they only have to learn one number system, right? They, they can be in the car. They don't need to know that it's in the key to hear the movement of a one to a six chord to a four chord to a five chord. Like that's okay. something that yep. a little bit of practice, like that's not that hard to figure out. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what I want so that they, when they come home, they can they can hear that. And then, and then we start breaking it into... Um, you know, those are kind of the four most common chords. Like everybody jokes, like, oh, you know, four, four, every, you can play every pop song with four. It's like, that's really reductive, but like, like there's a lot more to it than that. And so, you know, I, I start doing it where, you know, I do stacking of the primary chords over secondary roots. So like, I'll write things out a lot. And this is how you'd see it in a chord chart. You'd see like a one over three, you know, a C chord over an E chord, you know, in the key of C or, um, for like a D minor seven, I'll have them think of it as a four over two. You play an F chord over a D, you know? And so they think structurally in a way. And so the interesting parts is like, without really having to go super deep into the theory and teach them about like minor 11s and all this stuff, I just tell them like, whatever you can do to a four chord, like if you can add a nine or do a sus, sus two, whatever you can do to a four chord, you can do that when you put that as a structure over the two. It changes what the chord name would be. But it allows them to like, I don't know, just be be a little bit more like creative with it without really having to know all that theory right up front. It's like they can learn that later. So I'm very much into like, just play it. I'll tell you what it is later. Yeah, yeah. It's more like giving them uh, blocks they can uh, play with in different combinations, but they're kind of safe combinations and they're easy to understand. Yeah. And it's, and it's all graded too. It's, you know, just, just as it would be if they were trying to read music, it's like, okay, we're going to start with, um, I have a whole thing that I start off with where the, you know, it's, it's four notes, but they're using the full range of the piano. So it's like 29 notes, 29 out of 88, but they, they're really only using four, four notes. And I have this whole creative thing where it's like, I'm not trying to limit you, but I want to see how creative can you be with these four notes? Mm. And the answer That's is good. a lot. You know, you get how much music can you make with these four notes? It's a lot. Just listen to a lot of the pop music out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. The, um, and then giving them kind of concepts like, like I'll talk to them about, think of yourself as like a painter. You know, you're, you got the canvas. Go down and just nail those like lowest two C's and hold the pedal down. That's your mm. canvas. Now come up here and paint. Mm. You know, and you, and you give them, it's like creative constraints. It's like be creative, but within these borders. I want you to just do this. So you give them like the safe zone to kind of work within. Love it. That sounds great. Well, look, I'd love to unpack it more, uh, but we're running out of time. Yeah. Tony, thank you so much, though, for um, chatting with us today. It's, it's great to meet such a kindred spirit. Uh, we're clearly <laughs> right on a very similar path with our approaches and our dream students, which are those kind of transfer students. Yeah. Probably, probably, like for me, a lot of teenagers, particularly ones who've come from other teachers who perhaps haven't been quite so open and to what they want to learn and things and taking them and doing that interest-based approach. So congratulations. It sounds great. Oh, thanks, man. So you mentioned your Facebook group called Popmatics 101. Uh, have you got any other websites where people can find out more about you and what you do and maybe see you in action? Yeah, well, I mean, I have, I have a YouTube channel where I, I've been throwing up some stuff. The Popmatics 101 is definitely a good place to go. Again, this is all brand new. Hopefully, um, within the next month, I, do, I, I, have the, I have the domain for popmatics.com. So maybe check that when you hear this. Maybe it's ready. Beautiful. Yeah, (laughs) that sounds good. We'll put a link in our show notes to that and to your Facebook group. Thanks heaps, uh, Tony. Really appreciate it and look forward to keeping in touch. Sounds great. Well, it was great to hang out with Tony in today's interview and his has been a name that I've seen around the internet for some time. So it was really good to connect and see some of those similarities in our approaches, but also see how he takes things on a different path to me uh, when it comes to the pop music. Um, But really focusing on that interest-led approach, particularly for teenagers, which is exactly what we're talking about this month on the blog and the podcast and YouTube, is of course the best way to go. If there's one word above all when it comes to teaching teens and transfer students effectively, it's flexibility and following their interests for sure. So next week on the podcast, we're going back to the archives and we're going to actually do our first rebroadcast of a classic episode from a year or more ago. And it's called Five Tips for Teaching Piano to Teens. And what it's about 
Teen and adult students need a very different approach in piano lessons to young beginners, particularly if they're just beginning at the ages of 13, 14, and 15. So in this episode, I give you my top five tips for working with teenage and older students to make sure that you get the most out of them. I'm Tim Topham, and you've been listening to the Topcast from topmusic.co. We'll see you next week. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.